The theme of the conference is innovation and simplicity. I want to focus on the simplicity part, and there's been a lot of talk about simple language. Uh, now, the reason I want to talk about it is because I work as a technical writer, right? So, um, so I want to talk about the things that we, as technical writers, can do to achieve the, sim the simplicity, right? So, write simpler is the, like the first tip, but what does that mean? Let me get into the topic and then see if I can, uh, if I can maybe shed some light on it. So, what, what can you expect? You can expect talking, uh, me talking a little bit about um, uh, you know, like, like how we start in technical writing, how we, how we get started and how we get to writing simpler and simpler, and then about methodologies that we can use and apply, and then about tools we can, we can use and apply, and there's going to be a very special magical item that I'm going to present to you at the end, which you all can use, so be on the lookout for that. Don't walk out before the end of the presentation, it's going to be it. Uh, um, yeah, so let's look at a sentence. Like, so, so when I got started as a technical writer 10 years ago, uh, I, I was taught to simplify. You know, like, so you have a sentence like, in order to proceed to the next step on your interface, click the next button. Right? So we've heard from a lot of people. Simple, simple English was a very good, uh, very good talk. Uh, the guys talking about um, localization also mentioned this is going to be very hard to localize for people and for machines. Also, Gosha Pitel was talking, uh, she talked about uh, empathy towards the users, so have some empathy towards people who could be um, in, um, uh, in difficult situations or just English is not their native language, right? Um, so write simpler so they, can, so they can understand it. So we can simplify this sentence by removing this, the highlighted part and just say click next, right? Um, that, that's a saving of about 97% and I didn't make up this statistic. Um, yeah, talking about users who are in harsh environments, right? People don't have time to read your or our, or our beautiful prose, right? And this is something um, uh, that's uh, like initially it's hard to it's hard to get through because we're great writers and we want to show off our craft, but obviously that's you know that's not the right place for it. In fact, Gosha mentioned that I write flash fiction, and this is an interest for a lot of technical writers, creative writing, right? The reason I drifted towards flash fiction, I think, is because of, because of my work as a technical writer. I, I was simplifying everything. And then when I, got, when I got to writing a short story, which was you know, about 30 pages long, I thought, I don't need all, all those 30 pages. I need the 200 words that convey. You know? and so, so, so shortening a story down to 200 words is technical writing in the realm of creative writing. But I, I digress. I apologize. OK, so let's look at this. Um, uh, this literal sentence. The availability of the high tier partner features depends on your service level agreement achievement percentage. <laughs> so I, so um, I, uh, like I wanted to find an example of a, a very uh, co complicated noun cluster in English and it wasn't very hard to find because they are everywhere. Like I, I literally, op literally opened some random piece of documentation that it, I was thinking about and just found it on the first topic. Right, so it's just a uh, this, this phrase here, service level agreement achievement percentage, is a thing, right? Like it's a it's a it's a noun, it's a it's a it's it's an object or whatever. Uh, so how can you, um, like, what is it? <laughs> you know, like uh, so. Uh, uh, imagine that, like yourself being very educated people and people who can read at a very high level. You might might it might take you a while to process this noun cluster, right? If somebody is not a native speaker and not interested in reading that much, but are a user of a technical product, they're not going to want to try to figure this out. And if you're a bot trying to translate it or process it in any way, it's also not going to be very, very uh, useful to you. So there was a question asked yesterday. Um, can we use plain English in technical writing? Uh, because we have so much... Um, uh, you know, complex topics to talk about. So for example, somebody said talking about IPsec in simple language or the layers of the ISO OSI uh, model, right? So um, y uh, the trick here is that, yeah, you got to use those terms which are related to your field, but you also have to write simple sentences around them, right? So break them up. If you have a noun cluster like the one I showed you on the screen, percentage of whatever, to try to break it up, right? You don't need to have all those nouns in a row. Change them into a bullet list. No, I'm kidding. Um, 
And then there's this other question you ask yourself. Uh, as you're writing and you're simplifying your stuff, or maybe you got a lot of legacy documentation, because let's, let's not kid ourselves. The other writers are bad, we're good, right? So we get a piece of documentation written by somebody else, it's crap, we gotta fix it. Um, and we're simplifying, we simplify it, right? And, and we are in the process of simplifying when is the moment when it's simple enough, right? How do I know? So the answer is science. What is science? How does it work? Nobody knows. It's a great mystery of the universe. Um, science relies on principles and uh, theor theorems and algorithms. But I'm not going to explain this to you because you guys know, right? Um, so there's this, uh, there's this idea uh, called, uh, of a readability index, right? Readability index is basically a, a number that tells me how easy to read something is, right? So this is a piece of text. It has the readability index of x. For example, it has a readability index of 7. It means it's easy to read or it's hard to read, right? That's science. So an, a readability index it corresponds to, a, um, to levels that your readers can have, right? So you got your very beginner readers, right? Children who are just learning or people with reading disabilities. This is something you shouldn't overlook. It's another reason for plain writing, which was mentioned, inclusivity, right? So you got people who are, not, who are never going to achieve a very high level. Um, of, of, of skill at reading, right? But you know, also the starters, the babies, right? Then you have your um, average, um, you know, like young adult level reader, somebody who would read Harry Potter and think it's the best book in the world. I'm hearing, I'm not hating on Harry Potter, it's a good book. <laughs> um, but you know, like, like your first adventure with reading greater text, right? So you, you start developing your, uh, your style and your sense of what's good and what's bad, and then you start like appreciating more complex literature. Um, you're not able to read Shakespeare yet, but you're able to read Dan Brown, you know, that, that's that level. <laughs> then your, your general adult person, uh, my age, so, you know, about 55, and then you, uh, <laughs> like, you're, you're used to reading magazines, but those fancier magazines, you know, like Business, not business Insider, what's, the, what's a good... The Economist, yeah. So The Economist, like where the articles are longer and there's pompous phrases. It's, not, it's, it's much more complex than uh, technical documentation, but you're able to read it, right? You can understand those things. And then you have the um, really smart smarties. Uh, so that's the people with the highest level of uh, being able to read just anything. That includes um, that includes um, uh, Shakespeare, and that uh, uh, and that includes uh, Stephanie Meyer. Um, <laughs> so those, uh, depending on the uh, readability index that you adopt, there's different methodologies, right? Different types of indexes. They could, for example, be uh, be uh, as on a scale from zero to up upwards, right? So uh, from one to three would be your emergent and early readers, and 16 up would be your smartest, smartest smarties, right? So that's, and then kind of your text would correspond to a reading level, right? So you apply, this, uh, you apply some kind of algorithm to a piece of text. It tells you this text has a readability index of seven, which means it's good for, yes? For you, young adults, <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, so, uh, so yeah, that, that, that's how it, so this means that most young adults uh, statistically would uh, find this text readable, right? They would read it, they would, able, they would be able to follow it. So then you can play with your text, make it simpler so that uh, people at a lower readability level are able to follow it, or you can make it more complex so that lawyers are satisfied, which was mentioned in some talks. <laughs> Uh, so there's this uh, thing called uh, Gunning Fog Index, which is one of the types of indices uh, av available for readability in English. By the way, I'm talking about English, right? Because most of us work in English. Uh, other languages are more complex. For example, the Gunning Fog Index applies only to English, right? So if you need a, d a different language, you need to use a different index. This is one of the available ones. It has nothing to do with guns, because Gunning is the um, name of the person that's named after, right? Um, and then fog or smog. Have you heard these expressions? Fog index, smog index. Yeah, yeah. Some of you have have heard them. It means kind of how clouded is it? You know, like that's the idea behind it. I think it's also an acronym, but I'm not sure of what because uh, I didn't do my research. Um, 
so, so, so gunning fog index. I'm going to walk you through the algorithm of how it calculates the, the readability level. So first you select a passage of around 100 words. Um, it's a, one block, right? You select a block from your text, uninterrupted. Um, divide the number of words by the number of sentences. Okay. So you get a piece of paper. Uh, count the words with three or more syllables. Do not include proper nouns, familiar jargon, or compound words. I uh, highlighted familiar jargon. I'm going to come back to that. Um, add the average sentence length and the percentage of complex words. Simple, right? And then multiply the result by 0 0.4. <laughs> That's because uh, like, uh, I, uh, you can read up on it. Why, why this number, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a, like the methodology is available online. You can figure, uh, you, you can try and uh, look at it. It applies to English language, basically, because that has to do with the average length of sentence in English, right? Uh, getting into account the number of words, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's pretty complex, right? And uh, people have arrived at it through studies and science. Well, no, no air quotes, science. Like this. <laughs> So, the, um, so this is the formula uh, written out in mathematical form or semi-mathematical form, uh, which, uh, depending on the kind of person you are, is either very simple or very complex. But you don't have to worry about it because you would never be doing this on paper, right? You would be using a tool. Ah, there you go. Right, so there's, we use computers for these things. So a computer can calculate your index. And then, as I mentioned, there's, there's other indices. Indices? Indexes? Uh, um, for example, uh, the Fleshkin Kate or the Smog Index, very, very ni nice name, very sexy. Um, which you know, depending on what you're trying to do, you can use one of them. You can use multiple. Like you could have a, you could, you could set up your software to give you all the, all the four or seven other ones, right? So you, you want to compare, or you can test them and see which one kind of applies to you most. Um, yeah, I said in the slide, I said choose one, but you can choose multiple. Uh, however, <laughs> there's also these things that we know will not come out in this formula, like passive sentences, noun clusters, adverbs, complex phrases. Right? So you can make a phrase complex even though it's comprised of short words, right? Or you can make a very con uh, convoluted uh, thing out of very simple words. Or you could, uh, you know, a passive sentence will not show up if you just count how many words there are and divide this by some number, right? So you will not know that those are passive, se passive sentences. Or adverbs, have you read, uh, has anyone read uh, Stephen King's On Writing? Oh, there's like three people, nice. So, so he says don't use adverbs at all, right? So, <laughs> so uh, if you write a sentence like he went directly to cut her throat, you just say he went to cut her throat, right? So don't say directly. Uh, Stephen King, of course, uses bloody examples. So, so yeah, so passive sentences and all of these things, if you want uh, help with those, there's tools for that as well. For example, Hemingway app, which was mentioned also yesterday. Natalia mentioned it. Natalia? Natalia. And, um, um, uh, yeah, so it's basically it's an online tool. You go to uh, the HemingwayApp.com or HemingwayApp.com and it's like, a, it's like a text editor. You copy-paste your text. And then it highlights some things. Has anyone used it? And in the oh, yeah, quite a number of people, almost 12. The um, <laughs> <laughs> so that gives you um, so it, it like it gives you a little thing here, right? It says um, like uh, two adverbs meeting the goal. So meaning that like you're supposed to use two adverbs or fewer for this length of text. So you got two. That's fine. One use of passive voice, you got it. You can least you, with this length of text, you can use two and no more. So you got one that's fine. And it also says one phrase has a simpler alter alternative, which is this one, utilize. Like I see no good reason to use this word ever in technical <laughs> documentation <laughs> because there's the word use, right? Um, and one of 11 sentences is hard to read. This is the yellow one. It's uh, probably because it's long. But also, this tool has a way of determining uh, uh, subordinate clauses. So if you got a bunch of subordinate clauses, you got one sentence which is very hard to read. It's this one, right? So you got commas and uh, what's this called? M, M dash? M dash, right? Uh, so these things also make it harder to read. Well, supposed to make it easier because the M dash is a pause, right? So it's easier to read the sentence. But then again, there's 
around the pause, there are two sentences which are mixed into one sentence, so you're kind of making it harder to read. Anyway, so, so this, this would work, but... So th th this is what I mentioned before in the algorithm. Count words with three or more syllables, do not include proper nouns, or fam familiar jargon or compound words. So familiar jargon, right, is the idea which is going to help a lot with technical communication because there's going to be a lot of jargon. So uh, a tool like the Hemingway app does not allow you to enter your jargon. So say you're writing for um, uh, security or you're writing about networks or you're writing about Java, right? So um, there's going to be a lot of complex words or telecommunications is a good example, right? Uh, there's going to be a lot of complex words which the Hemingway app, uh, Hemingway app is going to highlight as either long words or it's going to highlight them as a word that doesn't exist, right? Because it's not in the dictionary that they are using. So, so uh, jargon is very important to us, as uh, many have pointed out in history, right? Quotes. <laughs> um, what I want to do is... I want to get this, uh, all this uh, jargon into the app so that it recognizes it, right? So, so yeah, so somebody mentioned Acrolinks in a previous presentation. I think it was today, right? Uh, it's a good tool for technical communication. And by the way, I'm not, in, I'm not sponsored by any tool vendor, but I, would I, I could be. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't mind that, so you can guys send me cash or, or large blocks of cheese, I will accept those as well. Um, so Acrolinks is a very good platform. Let me, let me talk about it for a little bit because I used to, I used to administer it, uh, a, a suite of tools with, and Acrolinks was one of them. And there was so much pain for the admin, uh, but there was so much joy for the users, right? Because, for example, Acrolinks has a uh, terminology database. So you're getting the jargon into Acrolinks, right? And you're telling it, uh, we want to call these things Say we want to call them uh, radios, right? We don't want to call them subscribers, which is a Motorola, uh, Motorola term, you know, like, well, not Motorola, it's in, the te uh, in telecommunications, but Motorola folks recognize them, right? So uh, back at, in the office, we call them subscribers, but people know them as radios, right? You put a radio to your ear, say, attention, attention, 420, we got a 420 in progress. No, uh, so the, um, uh, that's a weed joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> they will never invite me again. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so uh, you, you put your terminology in the uh, Acrolinks, and you, and you say these are the allowed terms. These are the terms which are not allowed. And you link them back, say, instead of this, use that other term. And then you can set up all your other rules. Like, right? for example, you want to say passive voice is OK. Or you, you can say it's OK within a percentage, right? So then this length of text is allowed to uses of passive voice like the Hemingway app. Or you could say, yeah, it's always fine, right? Or you can say it's never okay, right? So Acrolinks is a good tool, it's expensive though. So you gotta talk to your boss uh, to get the money. Uh, if you were to, uh, if you uh, listened to Aaron's talk yesterday, that was very good, talking about how to get budgets, ROIs and all of that. That's a, that's a good thing to do. And another thing that was mentioned also is HyperSTE. Um, which is something geared specifically towards technical writers and uh, used mostly in the man manufacturing industry, although there might be some uses outside, uh, which is basically like uh, Acrolinks, uh, but it follows the um, principles of simplified technical English, right? So this is another framework that you may be familiar with. Um, and yeah, for your document, it gives you uh, readability and then also the flesh Kincaid grade, which I also mentioned is one of the indexes or indices available for readability. Um, but it also allows you to use uh, profiles. You see this? Profile use procedural. So you could have different content types within your content, and you say some of these need to be more, uh, uh, more readable, easy to read, and some of them could be more complex because they are for the smarties. The, um, another thing um, you could do if you're very tech savvy is grab something like uh, readability score from GitHub, which is an open source tool, which has those calculations embedded, so you can um, plug it into your uh, system yourselves. Um, so, so say you're, uh, you're running a low-cost system like say, uh, Markdown on, uh, on Git, for example, that kind of thing, right? 
um, you could plug this tool into it so that on each commit into Git, you, uh, it runs on the, on the text and it gives you a score. So it tells you after your commit, readability has dropped. It means you're a great writer and very educated. But uh, uh, overall, you can track, you can track the um, readability of um, like the whole documentation set or a portion or just what you're writing, like just your one topic that you have open. Uh, uh, a lot of these tools, like um, uh, Acrolinx, HyperSTE, also work within the editor, and they have plugins for multiple editors. So say you're using Oxygen, um, you can run Acrolinx on your topic, which you just wrote or which you just updated. See, it will highlight in red maybe the terminology which is wrong, and it will highlight in orange sentences which are too long, et cetera, et cetera. It's like a spell check, uh, but beefed up. Like it's got more got more features. So you, if, you're very, if you're very smart, like this guy here probably, so you can uh, implement uh, an open source tool in an editor. So say you're using Vim or VI, or I don't know what you guys use these days. Um, and then you can, sorry? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so then you can, so then you, can um, you know, have those uh, results live as you're, as you're typing, right? Um, but, what about other things which are not easily caught, like are not syntactic issues per se? You know, things like over-explaining or over-complicating or off-topicking or using made-up hyphenated words. Um, the, um, like, so, so, for, so, for example, right, you could be trying to explain something uh, to a, uh, you're trying to explain something very basic to somebody who's a uh, system administrator. Right, so they, they got the computers, they, they've been using them since punch cards, right? They know what you're talking about when you say copy the files, but then you say, oh, press control C and select the new folder and press control V, right? So that could be over explained. No uh, readability index is going to catch that, you know, in relation to your, to your audience. Or over complicating things, like something is a simple, you know, like just, just, get it there, just get it in there. And you're like, well, in many uses and. and it's possible, and you should consider, right? So those things will not necessarily be caught by uh, any index. But what if I told you there's an amazing magic item which you can get, which is much cheaper than any tool you will ever find? It's very cheap. Very, it's, it's almost free. <laughs> and once you buy it, you have it forever. It's a lifetime license. And you can use it not only at work, but at home, your next job, and any other any other thing, you know, like writing your flash fiction or whatever, you geek. Would you give me one million dollars? No. So this thing, this amazing gift <laughs> that you're going to learn about in a second is a book. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> this is crap, this is the best book ever. <laughs> Yeah, this is the brilliant book. It's a brilliant book. Okay, let's agree to disagree. <laughs> okay, who, who's read it? Yeah, so there's a fair amount. Of, who thinks it's for idiots and by idiots? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just being ironic. They are just being ironic. Um, yeah. Anyway, I mean, this is my uh, this is my shameless plug because I actually wrote this. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's like it, like for me, it was a very good book. Uh, but I'm probably uh, I'm probably a dumb sheeple, uh, so <laughs> don't worry about it. Okay, for Polish speakers, um, there's this thing uh, called prosta polszczyzna um, and a ranking przystępności, right? Uh, <laughs> And uh, it's, it's like a thing with the uh, University of Wroclaw uh, where they uh, take Polish uh, and they like look at uh, different, there's a URL you can go to, there's a ranking thingy and it shows you like which, uh, which uh, official government office produces the least readable legislation or information or whatever, you know? Like so, so they ran this, they offer training if you, if you want to get better at writing in Polish. I'm not endorsed by them, I'm, they're not paying me, I'm just saying. Um, they, uh, they, uh, um, they give you, um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's online tools for Polish as well. I just learned before the presentation. Apparently my research did not, did not discover that. But if you, 
But if you Google it, you can you can find you know like there's places you can paste your publish into, and they'll also give you a score or highlight things which are not simple. So that's a good a good place to go. And that's all. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, there's some questions. Thank you, Pavo. Sure. I told you, right, when you see him once, you remember him forever. When you listen to him, you're gonna, he's going to appear in your dreams, I think. It's like, it goes so deep in you. Okay, questions? Right. Here's one. Hi, Pavel. Hey, Michal. What's uh, up? <laughs> Thank you for, for the presentation. It was Closer. very entertaining, yeah. but useless. I didn't, I didn't uh, as always, I didn't expect anything else. That's your uh, opinion. So I didn't learn anything new here. But I have a question, though. Sure, sure. Uh, what is considered a good readability score? Like, for which grade? How, maybe, what could you suggest? Or what do you know about it? Um, what would be the good grade for technical docs? Yeah, so uh, it's different with each index. Uh, the SMOG score, for example, level six is good for um, technical docs. But you should read uh, what they suggest in like the index itself, right? So the, like each, each index has this, has this, uh, what do you call it? The bracket, which is the perfect, the perfect for everybody. So you don't know? No, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like I said, in SMOG it's six. So maybe let me rephrase. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> So make it simpler so you can understand. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, if you could map it to a grade in a high school, in, oh, in a sure, school, sure. like something like for the seventh grader, for the eighth grader, and things like that. So yeah. I'm not talking about the actual index, like, like six, seven, 15, or whatever. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, let's say it's a good practice to write for people at the age of 16, 14, 13, and things like that. Yeah, so uh, for technical communication, sixth graders, that's, uh, that's, I'm not joking. Like this is the this is the level that they recommend. Uh, that's but sixth graders. It doesn't mean Polish or Chinese or whatever. It's American public school system sixth grade, right? That's the that's the standard. Okay. Which is you know pretty simple. But the the reason it's that simple is because we got to think about people who are not uh, native speakers of English. We're, we're thinking about bots who are translating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So that's the idea. Thank you. Hi, we talked a lot about uh, the language part of it and the mm -hmm. grading the language down so it's translatable. Is there any tool you know of that analyzes the readability in terms of the formatting? Like on your first slide, you did a nice job, suddenly everything's bolded and certain words stand out. So at one glance, I know what that slide's about. Mm -hmm. But some docs, you know, walls of text. So is there any tool that can automatically look at, you know, what elements of your page are gonna get read based on the formatting? That's a very good question, Brad. I hadn't thought of this. Uh, I'm, uh, maybe UX designers know something. Like, if anybody in the room knows, maybe you can raise your hand and chime in. I don't know, but that's a good thing to research. Um, mm -hmm. Harder to implement as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's got to be connected with a particular output, right? So it's got to be reading your PDF or your website or something. And even culture bias would be a part of it, probably. So. Yeah, that's another thing. And also, if you want to go deeper into culture, like, what, are these the right colors, the, the white background, or whatever? You know, it's it's yeah. a complex issue. And contrast and all of the above. Right. Yep. Okay. Sorry, just a question. So here I can chime in and I recommend something because there are, um, uh, with regards of contrast and readability uh, or maybe scannability of the text, uh, there are plugins for Chrome browser. Uh, if you catch me after, I will show them because I don't, don't remember the names, but there are at least two which help you with assessing how accessible your text is. So they will um, show you the, uh, how bad or how good the contrast on the page is and some of them in addition can show you how other people with disabilities like color vision or uh, uh, aged people see those pages. So there are at least two plugins that you can have in your browser, switch them in on your text and, and see uh, in terms of the structure and organization of and, and the design as well. That sounds great. Uh, thank you for that. 
Wojtek, and uh, uh, let's do this. You can catch Wojtek afterwards, or you could write a post about it. And you guys, if you want to read the post, you got to follow Ukontentowani. <laughs> I'm not sponsored you, by this <laughs> organization. <laughs> but I, I accept any some. Yeah, I cheese. Okay, cheese, yeah, yeah, I, I got yeah, it. Cheese, I oh, got cheese. Yeah, cheese is fine too. Bananas. <laughs> bananas? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Yeah, yeah, like he's that. full of bananas already. <laughs> okay, any other questions? There is one more here. Yeah. Hi, uh, Natalia here. <laughs> Hello. Uh, you presented also the tools um, for plain language in Polish, like the Wrocław University ones. Yeah. So thank you for that. I, I wasn't actually aware that we've got also some tools for Polish language to check it. So you also presented the algorithm, how to measure the readability. And considering that Polish language is, I would say, more complex grammatically than English one, and also it's less flexible, I would say. Do you think that the algorithms that those two programs, uh, I mean, for example, this Hemingway app and also this Polish uh, tool uses, that these are the same algorithms? You can count it like equally? No, uh, it's going to be a different algorithm. Okay. Uh, f first of all, it, a long word is defined differently in English. It's a different number of syllables, right? Makes sense. Yeah, and secondly, the statistics of the language are different, like you said. So the um, uh, the 0 0.4 is going to be a different number in Polish, right? Also, um, if you want to learn more about these uh, tools in Polish, I uh, I, uh, I got a lot of this from a conversation I had with uh, Joanna uh, back here. I don't know if you, if she wants me to say her last name. There she is, right? <laughs> yeah. So if you want to talk to her, she knows a lot. So so that. Uh, that's a very useful resource. Okay, I'm thanks. not sponsored by Jan. <laughs> <laughs> but you could be. <laughs> yeah, I could be. Yeah. Are, you s are you sponsored by anyone? Um, I mean, uh, my employer pays my salary, but they didn't pay me to come here. <laughs> my wife <laughs> supports me. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations on your wife, really. Thank you very much. <laughs> She's I'm honest now. Just get to know her. She's awesome. She's over there. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Wojtek. Bravo. <laughs> uh, Wojtek Dolby, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, one question about the tools that you showed, showed to rank your writing. So these all solutions are online based, right? Um, for, for us technical writers, there is a question of like confi confidentiality of sure. the content you write. So I wonder if there is, if you came across any solution that is offline um, that you could um, utilize, um, sorry, uh, use. Use, yeah. <laughs> good one. So yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Wojtek. The, um, um, so the Hemingway app is an online tool in your browser, uh, and all those other ones also have a browser component, and they are server-based apps, but they uh, sell uh, on-premise versions. So for example, Acrolinks, you can get your own Acrolinks, set up your Acrolinks server, and then within your network, people can connect to it and, and do their uh, checking. Okay, thanks. Yes, that's right, there's a, there's a desktop version of Hemingway. Although I'm not sure if it's like completely separate from online. Have you checked it offline? I didn't sniff. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Okay, we have one uh, last question. Yeah, it's uh, it's Ray over here. Um, Where are you, Ray? Can you? I'm in I'm in the back. Oh, there you are. Oh. Yeah, and uh, I'm not sponsored by Pavel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, but I just wanted to make a, a actually a comment. I was glad that uh, Wojtek raised the question of accessibility. Uh, as speaking as an aging person, the first thing you can do for readability is increase the point size of your mm. type. Uh, there's nothing simpler uh, for a lot of us older folks who, who are, uh, you know, <laughs> losing it. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, come on, Ray. <laughs> hey, <laughs> the spirit is willing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the really seriously, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that's happening is the population is aging uh, and us old folks, we're not so old anymore. Uh, but yeah, the body and the, the, the machine doesn't work as well as it used to. And we, we need the big type version. Yeah, so thanks for the comment, Ray. A very good comment. You know, like, um, uh, like Brad was mentioning, you, you can do other things to improve readability than language. So bigger type, larger margins, smaller margins. There are apps which can 
uh, which you can use. They will just magnify one word at a time. You know, just read one word, by, uh, a word by word. So that's also very useful to people. Um, uh, and yeah, thanks for the comment, old man. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. <laughs>